Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Becoming American, Immigration and Assimilation in Late 19th Century America. I'm Richard Schramm, the Vice President for Education uh, Programs here at the National Humanities Center, and I'll be moderating the seminar. It's good to have all our friends from the Florida Virtual School back for another academic year. I think we've got a lot of good seminars lined up for you. But let's get underway today. First of all, I want to remind you of our other online seminars that we do for uh, teachers all across the country. Uh, we have a good schedule for 2011-12. If you go to our website, you can uh, look at them. They're already filling up. You may want to register for them now if, uh, if you should decide to, uh, to do so. You notice something new about this page. It's called America in Class. You'll be hearing more about that. That is the new brand under which we'll be promoting all of the National Humanities Center's online programs for teachers. Uh, just to remind you, as in the past, if you go to the website for uh, Becoming American, there you will find the recording, you will find the PowerPoint, and you will also find the evaluation. Uh, as always, please fill that out and send it in to us. It's important to us, and it's also important to uh, your people in the Florida Virtual School and your Teaching American History grant. Uh, as always, we'll send you a documentation of participation so that you can present that to your uh, local certifying authority to get whatever credit uh, this seminar uh, entitles you to. Are there any questions before we begin, before we get underway today? If everybody's ready to go, why don't you send me one of those smiley face icons so that I'll know that uh, we're all on the same page and we're ready to go. There they go. Lots of nice smiley faces. Okay, great. All right, well, let's get underway then and learn about immigration and assimilation in late 19th century America. Our goals today are simple. We have two. One, to deepen your understanding of late 19th century immigration to the United States, focusing on what it meant for the nation and what it meant for the immigrants themselves, and as always, to provide you with fresh insights and resources to strengthen your teaching. The forum offered us some very strong uh, uh, comments here, uh, a lot of material on the forum. Uh, you're interested in how late 19th century immigration compares with contemporary immigration, and a few of you noted that your students often cannot distinguish between legal and illegal immigration. You wanted to know about the struggles and hardships, including forms of discrimination confronted by immigrants arriving between 1880 and 1920. You also wanted to know how and to what degree did immigrants assimilate uh, into American culture and integrate themselves into American life during this period. What was the economic status of immigrants vis-a-vis -vis that of native-born workers? Were immigrants exploited? And how did that, if they were exploited, how did that exploitation compare with the working conditions of native-born workers? How did lodges and fraternal organizations function in the lives of immigrants? How did the education received by immigrants compare with that received by native-born workers? How did the influx of immigrants affect the American labor movement? And how did it affect labor, uh, labor market, excuse me, and the labor union movement? How did the influx of immigrants affect different regions in the United States? How did working conditions of northern factory workers at this time compare with those experienced by agricultural workers elsewhere in the nation, especially in the South? And we still have more questions from the forum. How were different immigrant groups welcomed in America? How were groups sorted upon arrival on Ellis Island? Why did the majority of immigrants shuttle through Ellis Island while many went to Boston? Did single young men find entry into our nation easier than single young women? How about families? What about families that arrived without parents? How did communications between immigrants and the folks back home affect perceptions of the United States and influence the decision to leave the old home place for America? And finally, what was the trip to America like? Are there any personal narratives available, especially ones that describe the experience of teenagers? Now, we're going to try to get all, through all, to all of those questions through a set of five larger framing questions. What cultural changes can be traced to immigration? How and why did immigration make possible the transformation of the United States from a rural republic to an industrial nation? How did immigrants create stable lives in the midst of this economic transformation? How, in the midst of such uncertainty, did immigrants create a distinctive urban culture? And how did immigrants transform American politics? To lead us through those questions, we're pleased to have with us this morning Joseph Barton, Professor Emeritus of History uh, and of Spanish and Portuguese at Northwestern University. You see Joseph's uh, research interests there on the screen. He is the author of uh, Presence and Strangers, Italians, Romanians, and Slovaks in an American City, 1890 to 1950. And you see that he has been the recipient of American Council of Learned Societies, NEH, and Fulbright Fellowships 
and recently completed a book on capitalism and the persistence of community in Mexico and the Southwest. Let me now turn uh, the uh, baton over to Joseph. Let me just find his name right there. There we go. Okay. Joseph, you are now the presenter, so it's all yours. Thank you, Richard, and it's a pleasure to be here and to be among uh, a uh, group of uh, people who are teaching on the front lines of American education and to uh, uh, share with you some of my own work and the work of, uh, of a generation of historians who are, who are engaged now in trying to understand this very big topic and to uh, push uh, research in new directions and to, we hope, bring it up into the present to uh, bring some, shed some light upon the, the uh, uh, transformation to which, uh, uh, to which immigration, transformation of contemporary United States to which immigration continues to, uh, to uh, contribute, uh, continues to contribute. At any rate, um, just a couple of uh, points about what we are and are not going to talk about, uh, at least what I am going to talk about and what topics I won't address today simply because of limitations of time. Uh, first is uh, that uh, uh, we're going to talk about voluntary immigrants, that is to say newcomers who chose to come to the United States, however constrained their choices may have been at their point of origin, they still had some measure of choice, uh, will not uh, focus upon those enormous numbers of, numbers of Americans who did not choose, uh, Native Americans, African Americans, French settlers in the Mississippi Valley, Spanish colonists in the Southwest, Native Hawaiians, Inuit and Alaska, who group of whole ranges of people who did not choose. Uh, their histories are enormously important, uh, but their experiences, of course, differ in important ways from the voluntary immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe uh, who will command our attention today. And just as, a, as a, to put a finer point upon that uh, comment about the differing experiences, voluntary immigrants could leave, in fact, enormous numbers of them did. Involuntary immigrants, that is to say people forcibly incorporated, typically could not leave. And in that, uh, uh, in, that uh, um, in that radical difference in experience turns, of course, some very different historical experiences of, of uh, between voluntary immigrants and people forcibly incorporated into the United States. At any rate, we'll be talking about, again, uh, immigrants, voluntary immigrants in Eastern and Southern Europe uh, between the peak years of migration in the 1880s through the 1920s. And uh, uh, which brings to mind, we will not be talking about Asian immigrants, who, of course, were huge, hugely important, but uh, again, for constraints of time, we're not addressing them, nor well, we'll be talking about Mexican immigrants who are, who are becoming very important during this uh, period. I'm interested, it's not for lack of interest, it's for uh, simply uh, disciplining ourselves during the 90 minutes we have. Okay, um, let's uh, begin first by uh, by looking at some essential understandings that uh, that I hope we will develop. Uh, uh, I look at this uh, late 19th century immigration as a um, part of a second great immigration that began in the 1820s and was brought to a crashing halt with the immigration restriction law of 1924. What's the first immigration? The first immigration is the great immigration in the 18th century. Uh, uh, and now we're in the midst of a third great immigration, which has not yet uh, concluded. Anyway, the second great immigration, we'll be talking about the end of that, the big, the big uh, surge that came at the end of it in the late 19th, 20th century. Immigration made possible by transportation revolution. Uh, which was enormously varied in its sources, 
uh, meaning that it greatly extended the religious and ethnic variety of the United States. And uh, to my way of thinking, and, and uh, I think uh, in the minds, in the work of, uh, of, a, of a whole generation of uh, sc uh, scholars of, um, of immigration, um, this mass, massive inpouring shaped an urban industrial way of life. And it's on that, the, um, the process and consequences of that that uh, uh, we will uh, focus today. Now, so let's, uh, let's proceed on to the first, uh, the first topic, uh, general topic, which has to do with the uh, cultural changes that uh, can be traced to immigration. Let us say big cultural changes. And as a way of getting at that, I uh, gave, uh, offered you a couple of readings, uh, one from, uh, from a, uh, a Midwestern sociologist, a famous guy named Edward Ross, another from a famous New York public intellectual, Horace Callan, who had a had a famous spat, a dust-up, uh, uh, intellectual dust-up in 1914-15 that I think very uh, effectively outlines the cultural transformation that was going on in the midst of, of a, great, uh, a great immigration. Now, in the, here, uh, in the slide uh, that uh, we have up now are two crucial passages, which I think best best capture this the uh, the heart of uh, or the uh, the important uh, clash, the important element of this clash. And uh, let's read that. Richard, would you do the honors? Okay. Why don't I be Edward Ross first? Uh, sure. So Certainly, never since the colonial era have the foreign born and their children formed so large a proportion of the American people as at the present moment. I scanned 368 persons as they passed me in Union Square, New York, at a time when the garment workers of the Fifth Avenue lofts were returning to their homes. Only 38 of these passers-by had the type of face one would find at a county fair in the West or the South. And now Horace Callan. The older tradition has passed from a life into a memory, and the newer one, so far as it has an Anglo-Saxon base, is holding its own beside more and more formidable rivals. The expression in appropriate form of the national inheritance of the various populations concentrated in the various states of the Union, populations of whom their national self-consciousness is perhaps the chief spiritual asset. Think of the Creoles in the South and the French Canadians in the North clinging to French for so many generations and maintaining, however weakly, spiritual and social contacts with the mother country. Of the Germans with their, uh, Joseph, you're going to have to pronounce that one for me. Deutschtum, their Nader Korps, their Tourvereine, and Schützenfeste. <laughs> just, just the way I would have said it. Of the universally <laughs> separate Jews, of the intensely nationalistic Irish, of the Pennsylvania Germans, the indomitable Poles, and even more indomitable Bohemians, of the 30,000 Belgians in Wisconsin and their Belgian language, a mixture of Walloon and Flemish, welded by reaction to a strange social environment. Now, this uh, clash uh, is uh, occurring just uh, just after the peak uh, uh, numbers of arrivals, and uh, Ross had been wandering around. Ross was a, Ross was a curious about the United States, and he wandered everywhere, as was Callan. So these guys knew the United States quite well, and they knew especially the immigrant uh, uh, communities and neighborhoods that made up both American towns and especially big American cities at uh, just on the eve of World War I. So they were both deeply, deeply informed. But they had, of course, as you can see here, radically different notions of what is happening. For Ross, it was a disappearance, the threat to the very heart of American culture. For Callan, it was the 
it was the coming into being of a new American culture to be celebrated. And I suppose one of the fundamental questions is how could two people so deeply informed about the world around them come to such radically, such radically opposed senses of what was going on? For one, nothing but loss. For the other one, nothing but celebration of a new world. So it's a it's a it's a it's a clash it seems to me which is not simply one in the early 20th century it goes on today i just uh last year uh, uh made a survey of books published in 2010 on the topic of immigration and there were if anybody's curious 697 published just on that topic uh just in that one year and uh, they divide up in about half. Half think, think half of the books are focused upon the losses that come with recent immigration, the threat to a common culture, the breakup of communities, the uh, uh, the transformation, the unfortunate transformations in politics. The others are celebrating the emergence of a new American pluralism. So. This early 20th century clash continues to have echoes in the early 21st century as well. Jason, we have a question here from one of the participants. Could Ross just be acknowledging the loss rather than mourning it? Change is difficult no matter the situation. So was he just acknowledging it or, or is there, is he doing something more here? Uh, he's certainly acknowledging it, but he's also mourning it. And that's a very good term. Uh -huh. What, what Ross, sensed was that uh, the, uh, the entry of such a mass of newcomers whom he believed could never truly become part of American culture and politics. That was one of Ross's fundamental beliefs and we can go into why. But at any rate, he truly believed they could never become active, productive participants in American culture and politics. And with such a mass in New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, you name it, which he knew were the emerging centers of power, these big cities as emerging centers of power in American society. Ross mourned the loss of the rural republic that was, as Callan says, passing into a life of memory. Well, Ross would have agreed it's passing into a life of memory. And for him, that was a profound and a loss that he mourned deeply. So yes, change is difficult, but it's more difficult if you believe that you have lost something irretrievable, irretrievably, and nothing remains of it. And that was a feeling that Ross had. Right. And another participant writes, his views sound a bit elitist. Was Ross, was he considered elitist at the time? No, Ross was actually a populist. Ross was, uh, was a guy who loved to hang out at Iowa fairs. And, and uh, in fact, he was an expert at judging hogs in Iowa fairs, uh, which uh, last time I looked is not a particularly elite occupation. So Ross, Ross was a, Ross was home. Ross was very much at home in rural small town America in a way that uh, that uh, probably a lot of uh, politicians who are going to face the Iowa primaries would uh, would enjoy being uh, uh, Iowa caucuses. Uh, uh, Ross could tell them a thing or two about how to hang out at an Iowa county fair. Uh -huh. So he's he's not an elitist, but he is very much a partisan of Anglo-American, uh, of the Anglo-American roots of American culture and a partisan and a connoisseur of the uh, cohesion that he thought those roots brought to 
to American life. It sounds too as if there's some some rural urban tension in what he's saying there. If he's if he's you know at home in Iowa, small town, rural America, and he's he's looking at the West and the South as the norms of America, do we can we detect there some anti-urban bias? Oh, yeah, very much so. Uh, although Ross was a cosmopolitan too. I mean, he was home. He was home in Fifth Avenue apartments of. Uh, of New York's elite, uh -huh. but but so long as those as those Fifth Avenue apartments were populated by Anglo-American Protestants, he uh, he was not very friendly toward the uh, religious diversity that was uh, that immigrants were bringing to the United States and thought that the Catholic Church uh, threatened um, threatened the dominance of American Protestantism. Uh, and he was especially suspicious of, of American Jews. So there's a tinge of anti-Catholicism and anti-Semitism in his, uh, in, uh, in Ross's uh, mind. So, and uh, in, and since uh, the cities were more and more not only immigrant, but also Catholic and Jewish, um, and then increasingly Orthodox Christian as well, in the early 20th century, Rawls regarded them as threats to American religious cohesion as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that gets to one of the questions in the forum about the um, struggles and, and discrimination often that faced uh, immigrants moving into the country at this time. Before we move on to this, why don't we direct our attention, to, why don't we direct the participants' attention to the discussion questions there in the corner of the screen and, and see if we have any, any responses to them. In the meantime, we have another comment in the chat. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Ross was a populist, populist. Would you also consider him to have a strong sense of nationalism? Yes, uh, Ross was very strongly nationalist American, uh, not in the sense of uh, an expansionary nationalist. He wouldn't have uh, been drumming to go into the Philippines, for instance, or or uh, or to uh, reject American power in World War in World War One, for instance. He was uh -huh. a reluctant, reluctantly supported those wars, but he was a nationalist in the sense that he thought that the United States was an exceptional nation. We talk a lot about American exceptionalism now. Uh, exceptional nation that uh, was the last best hope of, of humankind. And so Ross, in that sort of benign sense, Ross was a nationalist, but he wasn't a jingoist. He was not a uh, partisan of projecting American power here, there, and everywhere. Mm -hmm. And would it be fair to say that he saw that sense of American exceptionalism being undermined uh, by all the waves of immigration? Oh yes, he thought it was. He thought that, in fact, that was one of his greatest fears: uh -huh. is that is that immigrants would make uh, would make uh, the United States look uh, oh a lot like Germany or or uh, or Russia. That is to say, a poly polyglot nation that uh, didn't have any core. Okay. Well, we could move on. We've got about an hour or so. Okay. Um, now, uh, the uh, the second theme that uh, I think it's important to, to grasp, and this one uh, takes us into the heart of the of the new uh, scholarship that's been done, as well as draw upon some of the classic. Uh, um, uh, understandings of, of late 19th, early 20th century society, and that has to do with the with the consequences, with the uh, uh, working of immigration in the in the transformation of the United States from a rural republic to an industrial nation. It's worth recalling at this point that even as recently as 1860, the average size of the American factory was about 35, and the uh, Typical uh, uh, community in which uh, Americans lived uh, barely uh, topped uh, 3,000, um, and uh, the one big world-class city at this point in the United States was New York, and the rest were small and, and uh, growing, but still small, relatively small cities. By the by the 1920s, because the United States was uh, was uh, home to some of the 
single largest factories in the world uh, with uh, 35, 40,000 uh, workers under one roof, one continuous roof, as in the case of uh, the steel plant in Pennsylvania, and home to some of the very largest uh, industrial cities in the world. So it's an enormous transformation in the, midst, in the course of a half century. So the the uh, one of the one of the big challenges is try to grasp how immigration made possible that transformation, not just how it reinforced it, but how it made it possible. And uh, one of the one of the ways in which you think about that has to do with the with the let's see where is that table a series of tables on there. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Let's look at this table just for a moment to get a sense of of, uh, of the enormous peaks of migration in the period we're talking about from 1880, about 1880, and then again 1901, 1910. Uh, you've got these two massive peaks, which, by the way, if you look at uh, the next table, which is uh, of our own time from uh, the beginning of World War II, Two to down to 2000, we see something of the same huge rise as we saw in the late 19th, early 20th century, which might uh, uh, provoke us to uh, to think about some comparisons. At any rate, this massive, these two massive peaks uh, punctuate the uh, the half century between uh, 1870 and 1920. Uh, <clears throat> which contribute to an enormous uh, growth of the labor force. And as you can see in these two lines, this is a contribution of, uh, of immigrants to the growth of the labor force, the new workers in the labor force. This is a contribution of immigrants and their children to the growth of the labor force through these decades. So you can see at peak points, uh, about uh, four out of every five uh, uh, new, new workers, uh, well, three out of four of every new, uh, of every new worker, every of uh, the new workers are coming from from immigrants and their children, an enormous contribution to the American labor force. And at the same time that they're concentrating within within uh, new industries and providing the bulk of the labor force. They are also uh, flooding into American cities of 25,000 or more. At the same, as you can see, the huge flood by 1920, where the foreign born, three out of every four foreign born people are in big cities of 25,000 or more. Uh, in while at the same time, rural native born people are remaining largely in small towns, rural areas. And only after 1920 do half of all native born people join into the city. So put these together as uh, uh, Richard and Karen have so creatively done here and uh, think about the impact of these extraordinary changes upon both the immigrants themselves and upon the larger American city. Well, maybe a way to, to, to uh, one question to, to try to grapple with is what strikes you about the conjunction of these changes? That is to say, these are three enormous changes. One is the remaking of the American population itself with the inrush of immigrants. The second is the recomposition or the remaking of the of the workforce, and the third is the transformation of the American city into an immigrant city, home of ethnic communities. All of them happen simultaneously. Now, one of the big challenges, it seems to me, the historical understanding is how to grasp, how to figure out. Um, uh, how to best imagine these transformations in work, residence, and daily life that follow these big, big developments. That's one of the challenges that, uh, that historians face, and it seems to me one of the challenges we all face in trying to grasp in our imagination that 
these are going on simultaneously and changing the world around these late 19th, early 20th century Americans at a pace that's almost impossible to, uh, to uh, understand. We think we're living through fast changes. It's nothing like these, I would say. Okay, so while we're, <clears throat> uh, the, the question you posed here, what strikes us about the conjunction of these changes and how might we best imagine the transformations in work, while our, our participants are mulling over those and making their, framing their responses, we have a few questions here. If we could go back quickly to the, to, um, uh, the uh, ross uh, Kalin debate, uh, one participant asks, how would Ross have reacted to the immigrants who were heading for rural areas uh, to farms? How did he respond to that? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Ross, uh, Ross knew a lot about these people and wandered around among them. Now, they would have been mostly Norwegian, uh, German, Czech, uh, uh, Swedish, uh, Danish, uh, with a small group of, uh, of Polish uh, mm -hmm. uh, going out into, into farms. In fact, if you look at the whole immigration from 1880 to 1920, about 10% uh, of that massive immigration, uh, about 35 million people, went to farms, to rural areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Roth would have reacted to them. Uh, he would have welcomed them insofar as they began to adapt traditional American ways of farming. That is to say, farming on 170, 60, 70 acres. Uh, and uh, growing crops for for the market. In fact, they did do that to become. They became some of the most successful wheat farmers, for instance, in Nebraska, or corn farmers in Wisconsin. Some of the most some of the most uh, most successful of those small farmers we now know were uh, uh, were recent immigrants. And if you look in New England, for instance, for, from which uh, most Anglo-Americans had departed from rural areas by the 1870s, 1880s, these farms are being reclaimed by Polish farmers who created in uh, Massachusetts and, uh, and on Long Island especially uh, new uh, truck farms that became some of the main sources of American fresh fruit, fruit and produce in Boston, New York, uh, Philadelphia in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, before the uh, advent of refrigerated cars and big-scale ir irrigated agriculture in California and the Southwest. So, so even though the great bulk of such people went, of uh, such recent immigrants went into cities, there was a very significant, and not, not, not in numbers so much, but as in successful agricultural inno innovators who went into the countryside. But we don't understand very much about this yet and how they did it and uh, with what long-term uh, consequences. But we do know that it happened. So it's an extraordinarily interesting part of this, of this uh, story. Okay. So that one can find, for instance, one can find uh, uh, the brother, brothers or uncles or aunts of steel workers out in the Wisconsin potato fields successfully cultivating and you have these these remarkable family stories that, that bridge uh, bridge all of the uh, arenas of American life uh, in the late 19th century. Uh -huh. So we could say then that the the immigrants who went to rural areas, because they became farmers, um, they were sort of able to assimilate more easily into American culture. Whereas the ones who stayed in the cities because they, they were able to find a supporting ethnic communities, that, that assimilation was a little bit different. They, uh, Ross would have seen them as staying essentially foreign, whereas the rural people, they became, to whatever extent, they were going to become American. Is that fair to say? Yes. I mean, Ross was very much a believer in the Jeffersonian myth that people, ah, who, labored, who, people who labored in the earth were, uh, no matter what their origins, would be redeemed by... Uh, by uh, that uh, kind of yeoman labor. Okay, and we can. But if on. you spent your life, if you spent your life at a foundry, he wasn't so sure about those. Things. Yeah, yeah. So the persistence of the Jeffersonian uh, myth there. So we have a, we have another question here. Um, is this the period when the major northern cities start to have establishment of ethnic enclaves in the cities? I think the answer to that is yes. What about the 
the education of the children. Now, we have several questions here, not surprisingly from teachers, um, about the education of the children. I think we're going to get to that pretty soon. So why don't we hold off on that and then move on to our, our, our next point um, that we have here about um, – uh, the way they made a new life for themselves, and I think we'll get that question about education uh, when we when we begin to deal with that. Right, and what I've done here is put together a, a photographic record of American education, which is very rich. Uh, many of you will know Jacob Reese's uh, photographs of uh, of, uh, <clears throat> of how the other hat and how the other hat lives, and uh, and of uh, and uh, those are remarkable images. What I've done here is to try to put together a, a series of sort of photographic essay. I think there are 14 here of, uh, of immigrants all the way to Pittsburgh and then uh, uh, setting up uh, their, ho their homes and of, uh, entering the huge uh, uh, steel factories of Pittsburgh. With Pittsburgh, it strikes me as uh, if you want to understand immigrant America, uh, you could do worse than choosing Pittsburgh. And by the way, it's also got the greatest Slovak restaurant the rest of uh, <laughs> west of uh, uh, the Slovak Republic. At any rate, um, there's an Italian family on the way to Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh, the point, 1900. This is when Pittsburgh is still relatively a small industrial city uh, focused on making uh, iron. Uh, suddenly, by 1956, a second industrial revolution sweeps through that creates this huge strip of factories, uh, the Monongahela at night, looking toward the Johnson Loughlin plant, which is the second largest industrial plant in the world at this point, 1906. Suddenly, it was built between 1904 and 6, and there, the Johns and Loughlin plant set in Homestead among immigrant workers' housing. The plant to the, your left, the immigrant workers' housing uh, uh, stretching to your right. An iron ore mountain, most of it brought from uh, ships that are passing uh, in front of my window right now. I'm on Lake Superior and I can see the ships going from Duluth to, to uh, iron uh, to uh, steel factories, uh, there's one passing right now. Well, all of this would have been brought from from, uh, from iron ore from uh, northern northern uh, Minnesota from the iron range. Okay. Typical work setting, a steel porous platform. That's a Slovak worker to the right there. Uh, uh, and uh, there the typical uh, form or a typical setting in which uh, immigrant crews work. This is an immigrant crew of 22 people. You know, some of them are obscured in the smoke and, and steam, and they would have been composed. This one, this particular one, was composed of eight different immigrant groups, uh, origins, who were somehow melded together in one efficient working crew. They were pictured because they uh, uh, topped the plant in output at this particular furnace for the year 1907. Okay. Before, before we move on to the uh, uh, postcards, we've got a lot of comments here about the environmental uh, degradation that was going on in Pittsburgh, and then also the safety of the workers. I mean, here these guys are working around this molten steel, and they were dressed, you know, uh, pretty well, just like these guys were dressed. No safety equipment, and as Jack Carter says, no OSHA. Um, it's quite striking from uh, from what we uh, what we see today. But I think the, uh, if we can go on to the postcards, these I think are, are really uh, excellent, and I think uh, uh, we could uh, offer these to our teachers as wonderful teaching tools. Yes, these are terrific questions. In fact, it's one. These are uh, one of the current projects I'm working on is is what I call the immigrant body. Uh, <clears throat> how do how do immigrants who are exposed, as all of these questions point to, exposed to enormously dangerous environments? Uh, how do they learn to care for them, to care for their health in such in such settings? After all, they're two and a half, three weeks away from uh, a small, let's say, uh, uh, Polish village where healthcare is vested in in uh, the 
older women of the village, and suddenly they find themselves in Pittsburgh where they've got to seek out uh, male, white-coated males in positions of authority in hospitals to seek their medical care. How do you learn to do that? And you had to learn to do it all the time. Of those 22 men pictured in the earlier uh, slide, this one, uh, the average, on the average, one out of 17 will have a grievous body, bodily image before the end of 197 that will put him out of work for at least three months. One out of 17, year in, year out. And those are the most grievous injuries. So it's an extraordinary, and that says nothing of the long-term uh, impact upon such, uh, such people. So these are very important questions, and we're just beginning to learn how they took care of themselves after those inevitable injuries. Okay, quick, quick question here. What was the life expectancy of these men? Uh, the life expectancy was about 52, 53. 52 or 53. And, <clears throat> but, their work, but their working lives would typically, they would have to taper off at about 45. Mm -hmm. After, and I know this from tracing the life histories of 850 of these guys as they work in such conditions. So by about age 45, they would have to find other kinds of employment because they could no longer keep up the pace of work in these, uh, in these uh, big plants. So what we have in front of us now, these are fantastic questions. Thank you. My, uh, would uh, could spend uh, the rest of the time on each of them, but we must move on. Okay, now what I have collected here is a series of postcards. These are, as you'll see, each of them is labeled postcards. These are all in the archives of Industrial Society at the University of Pittsburgh, great place. Um, these are postcards which were taken in uh, mostly in the Jones and Laughlin uh, steel yard of mill workers, immigrant work, immigrant mill workers, they were then printed up as postcards so that people would get together and subscribe. And they were mostly mailed back to villages in southern Poland, eastern Slovakia, southern Ukraine, north, uh, southern Italy, uh, Croatia, uh, wherever these immigrants hailed from, and they hailed from all over the place. Postcards, little written note, I've seen uh, hundreds of these in archives in Eastern Europe, and typically the note would be a, a note about wages and, and working conditions and when you're going to come, uh, join us. And uh, so these are uh, sort of visual letters from the heart of industrial, immigrant industrial America back to the images villages from which immigrants had come. Well, Joseph, if you could just set the stage for us. Now, what kind of village in Europe would one of these postcards land in? Well, you, you look at this postcard, you're going to look at others, you're going to see an industrial landscape. What, what landscape would, would this land in if it were, you know, sent back home to Sweden or Hungary or Romania or wherever? Right. Well, I can give you I've lived in three villages in Eastern Europe for extended periods of time. And uh, let me just start with one of them uh, uh, in uh, Eastern, uh, uh, Eastern Slovakia called Hutzlovice. It's right on the Ukraine border. 800, when I was there, 800 people at its peak population in the, uh, 1900, which is one when the immigrants would have begun to leave, it had about 1,200 people. And, uh, it was uh, a uh, compact village. Uh, most of the houses were built of wood with thatch, thatch roofs. Uh, the floor would have been dirt. Uh, the source of heat would have been a great big oven made of stone. And the favorite child, by the way, got to sleep on top of the oven in the dead of winter when temperature would often fall to 10 below zero. Uh, and uh, um, and it would be uh, these would be villages from which people had been migrating 
for a couple of generations already, but in within Eastern Europe, they would have been familiar with a journey, a long journey to work to southern Russia to pull bees, or to southern Poland to do construction work, or to uh, uh, to Hungary to uh, to work in uh, the wheat in the wheat and hay fields of eastern Hungary. So these were already migrants. But by about 1900, they began to leave on an even longer journey for the United States. And it was that, that journey that brought them to Pittsburgh. And uh, they would have been leaving at first, the, uh, the ratio would have been seven uh, young males leaving for every young female who left. That would be the ratio of 1900. By 1910, the ratio was even uh, for every young male who left. A young female would leave. They left mostly unmarried, the males and females both, and they left in along and they traveled along pathways that were marked out both by their uh, uh, siblings and by their fellow villagers. So these are people moving along along pathways that by 1956 were very well known. They were not simply venturing into the unknown. Right, and we've had several comments here about how, what, what the impact of these postcards would have been uh, back home, and maybe we'd like to move on to show another postcard here at this sure. point. Um, <clears throat> Some people were saying that the, the, perhaps the immigrants, what they wrote on the postcards, they, that was sugarcoating America. Come here, work, it's a city, you know, the streets are paved with gold and so forth. Uh, but the visual image, it would seem to me, would be um, perhaps more powerful than what they were saying in writing on the other side of the postcard, if the people back home could even read that. So what... If you if you were a an immigrant looking at these images, what would you take away? What would you take away from this one, for example? A group of men standing there in their hats, smoking. Several of them are smoking pipes. What would someone back in that Slovak village see if he or she were looking at that photo? Well, what they would notice right away is that uh, the, all of the the guys in the uh, photograph are wearing their hats. If you were <clears throat> what that means is uh, you keep your hat on because you do not feel obliged to show any sign of respect to anybody. In short, you're asserting that I'm somebody by keeping your hat on. If you were to meet somebody who was of a slightly higher status in the village from which these guys came, you would have had to take off your hat. Put it down to your side and greet that person with bare head. And so these guys are asserting, we're somebody. We don't have to take our offer a hat to anybody. And secondly, they're smoking pipes, something that in Eastern Europe would have been re reserved in the village. You would have had to smoke secretly. You could not have openly smoked like this because, again, the use of tobacco was something that was reserved at least in public, to elites, village elites. Here they are smoking openly. I don't care who you are. I'm going to smoke in front of you. And so these are assertions. These are crowd assertions of who they are. And if you see the sort of crooked smile, the guy on the left, it seems to me, at least I'm fantasizing, that that's what he's thinking about as he sends this photograph back home. What would they have said on the back? They would not have tried to paint illusions about streets of gold. They would have quoted prices per hour that they could earn in their wages. And what it would work out to is that you could earn in, you could earn seven times as much in even the hardest work, the most poorly paid work in Pittsburgh than you could back in Hotsovica. That's a huge differential. And by the way, it's the same differential as, say, between uh, working uh, yard work in Chicago, Illinois, and continuing to raise corn in Chiapas, Mexico. The ratio is about seven to one. You can make seven times as much in yard work. That's a huge, a huge gain. And no matter the conditions, uh, and nobody was, uh, was uh, 
uh, in the dark about what real conditions were in work. They knew those very well. Um, but the wage differential made it worth it. Okay, so we can move on to the next vote, uh, next uh, postcard. Uh, we can also say here that what these postcards represented uh, were the pull factors, the factors that pulled people to America as opposed to the push factors that were pushing them out of Europe. And you have that push-pull tension with all immigration, right? Right, exactly. And the, <clears throat> the pull, the push, the push, of course, was was were many. One is the uh, traditional agriculture was collapsing in Eastern Europe, just as it was collapsing in the United States. You had in the United States the population rose as as a small scale agriculture began to collapse in the late 19th century. Same thing was happening in Eastern in Eastern and Southern Europe: a collapse of traditional agriculture, disappearance of markets, and a great difficulty in making ends meet. Second was was the growing burden of government uh, service and and uh, uh, particularly in armies um, the uh, all of these uh, uh, all of these uh, the sources of immigration all of these areas were under we have to recall before World War one were under imperial authority of one sort or another imperial rule the Russian Empire or the austro-hungarian Empire or the Turkish Empire or the the uh, heavy hand of the Italian state. So they were all under imperial rule that penetrated very, uh, very deep into each village. So these were by no means um, uh, happy peasant villages um, out in the middle of nowhere. They were under imperial authority. And the third is, and the third that, uh, thing that uh, pushed them was uh, a, what you might call a kind of revolution of expectations within villages. After all, these were, uh, even though they were under imperial rule, they were areas of subject peoples who were going through a nationalist, uh, uh, a nationalist awakening, and hence uh, um, um, uh, that was all. That that was also uh, reviving uh, hopes of better lives, and so. So there were many factors that were pushing people out of villages. Okay. And they're yeah. ending up then, I'm sorry. But we have two questions here. Um, were, they, were these people sending money back home, as is common yeah. today? The money, they were. Okay, and did many of them go back home after earning money here? Yes. yes. There's, a, there's a great return immigration. Uh, the, uh, uh, the exceptions to that would be Jewish immigrants who did not have homes to go back to because of Russian uh, imperial uh, uh, discrimination and because of the enormous uh, pogroms that were directed, uh, the killing uh, campaigns directed against Jews in Eastern, in Eastern Europe. Uh, but for every other group, there was massive return. In the case of Italians, about a third you can go between the times about a third went back, uh, Slovaks about 40% uh, went back, and in the case of Bulgarians, which is the highest ratio, about 85% of all Bulgarian immigrants eventually went back. Uh -huh. Now that left a good many here, about 35 million. So, so what you have is a churning back and forth. Uh, uh, we like to say about Mexican immigrants that the difference between earlier immigration and Mexican immigration is people can go back all the time. Well, I'm sorry, that's just not the case, that uh, this immigration across the Atlantic was is a churning back and forth, just as the immigration from Mexico is, uh, 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 is, uh, is moving back and forth across those borders. In my own case, my great-grandmother made nine trips back and forth across the Atlantic, back to a very tiny village in eastern Moravia before she finally decided to settle in the United States. Nine trips. Well, that, that Each of them costing her seven fifty in steerage. <laughs> well, that, that going back and forth may be explained here by one of our participants who noted that she helped some uh, older Italian men uh, fill out their social security forms, and they told her that when they went back to their villages, they were treated like kings. Yes, yes. In every Italian village, in every Italian immigrant village, there are <clears throat> there are big houses uh, called the houses of the Americani, the, those who have been in the United States, and those are the most uh, the most uh, 
uh, impressive houses in those villages. We have two good questions here too. Did the were there restrictions on leaving the homeland? Did the national imperial authorities discourage immigration? They were tried. They? they tried, but they were they were completely helpless in the face of the of the flow of people. Uh -huh. um, they were they were as unsuccessful in that as say even the North Koreans are today. And and no and no none of those imperial powers had any of the surveillance methods available that are available today and, and as we know from the numbers of of uh, refugees in, in the world today uh, the even even the countries most intent upon restraining their populations at a very difficult time and they have all of the advantages if you can call them that of modern surveillance methods uh, none of those were available in the early 20th century. Okay, we have another question here too. Um, did factory owners utilize anything like indentured servitude at this point, or there, was there no need because of the influx of immigrants? I guess another way of asking that might be: Did, did American uh, businesses and industry recruit people abroad, or did they not just have to do that? They did recruit um, in some small measure. The, the, the most, most recruiting was done, however, by farm states like uh -huh. Iowa and Wisconsin. <clears throat> they were the ones who really recruited, and they were somewhat successful. And by the way, Iowa, uh, before the turn against immigration a few years ago, Iowa was, uh, had uh, the state of Iowa had a recruiting office in, uh, recruiting offices all over Mexico trying to recruit uh, people to come to uh -huh. Iowa for agriculture. Uh, they stopped doing that now for obvious reasons, but at any rate, um, the uh, the industrial centers, the industrial companies, the big big steel producers, for instance, did not have to recruit. Their the recruitment was done for them by people themselves. In fact, what we know from from uh, very good studies of uh, of a huge sample of five, uh, fifty thousand immigrants uh, between eighteen seventy and nineteen twenty. Uh, about 97% of all immigrants paid their own way. Only about 3% had their way paid for them by, by somebody who wasn't a member of their family or whatever. So most immigration was self-financed and uh, carried on by, <clears throat> by networks of immigrants rather than by big recruiting agencies. Okay, we have another question here too. Did you see a difference between the groups who went back and groups like the Jews who stayed. In terms of the information they sent back home. That's a really interesting, yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a great question. Um, first of all, immigrants wrote letters, enormous numbers of letters. If they weren't literate themselves, they would hire a scribe to do it. And the Hungarian archives especially are full, just room after room, box after box of such letters that were confiscated because the Hungarian authorities feared that immigrant letters would start nationalist rebellions all over all over the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So they would seize them. So we know that the, the flow of letters was big. Secondly, they sent all these postcards. They sent all sorts of things, remittances, enormous numbers of remittances, and, and huge amounts of money. So that's one kind of communication that went back went, uh, back and forth. Secondly, there was more formal uh, communication in in newspapers and pamphlets and and books. Um, um, the biggest, uh, uh, second biggest printing press in the Polish language, for instance, was uh, uh, was not in Poland. It was in Chicago in 1910. And off that printing press poured all sorts of stuff about the United States, from daily newspapers to pamphlets to novels to travel accounts to everything else. So you had this big flow of information. And the third kind of information that flowed was word of mouth. And, uh, um, and the people who traveled back and forth did, we you know, communicate, communicate a lot with people in their home villages and, and we know this from from all the stories 
that uh, circulate still today. You can go in the village in, in eastern Hungary, uh, that was uh, from which a lot of immigrants came, and uh, and you will hear in oral tradition stories that were told by returned immigrants. Now, as for Jews, people who did not go back because, of course, they were uh, uh, their return was resisted. In fact, it would, it would have been uh, subject to attack and, and imprisonment and even uh, death if they returned. Um, there, the, cir the circulation of information uh, was massive as well because the Jewish press, the Yiddish press, Yiddish literature, Yiddish stage, and in the early in the early uh, uh, the emergence of American movie industry, Yiddish movies circulated all over Eastern Europe. So you had a different kind of uh, flow of information about the United States between Jewish communities in the United States and the Jewish communities, the remnant of Jewish communities that remained in uh, Eastern in Eastern Europe. So in all of those cases, the the flow of information. Uh, some of it fanciful, some of it uh, uh, utterly realistic among those communities was just, just extraordinary. And uh, we just began to recover some of that as we dig into those, uh, for instance, those uh, once closed archives of, of the former Soviet Union, uh, now Russia, the, those archives as they're opened up to the Western researchers are yielding just massive documentation about this uh, remarkable flow of information and communication uh, among uh, people separated by the ocean. So even before the internet, information flowed globally? It flowed globally. Flowed globally. It's just amazing. Okay, Joseph, we have about 30 minutes, and I think okay. we need to move on. Yes, we do. So uh, uh, immigrant steel workers housing, the characteristic uh, Cheat by jowl, uh, uh, to use an old English expression uh, of immigrant life in uh, in Pittsburgh with the big plant below. This was the world that immigrants would have to make humanly habitable if they were to thrive in industrial America. Which brings us to our next topic: How did immigrants create stable, stable lives in the midst of this economic transformation? Uh, and uh, and I ask you to read, uh, pay special attention to uh, uh, Margaret Byington, a pioneer study of, of immigrant life, uh, and in fact of American industrial life, uh, where she asks the question, you know, how do you how do you live on a dollar sixty five a day? Uh, wow. And uh, well. I suppose it's a question that uh, now, unfortunately, requires a certain resonance uh, uh, in contemporary United States. Maybe not a dollar sixty-five, but anyway. So, how immigrants learn to do that is is uh, is an extraordinary story that we are now understand a good deal more about. Um, the cobbling together a living. Um, uh, doing without consumer goods, uh, uh, the, the wretched choice of having to of having to sacrifice uh, one or two child's uh, children's education to uh, in order to have them work and fill in. These are all double wrenching, double wrenching uh, decisions that parents made, and with uh, in order to build a, a build a life on a dollar sixty five. Shall we throw this Shall we throw this uh, passage out on the table and and see yes. how people respond to it? You may take a crack good. at it. Sure. Okay. Let us turn from general facts and consider, in the first place, how the economic problem of life can be worked out on a dollar sixty five a day. With the single men, the problem is, of course, a simple one. Many care little how they live, so long as they live cheaply. One of the lodging houses which I visited during the Depression consisted of two rooms, one above the other, each measuring perhaps 12 by 20 feet. In the kitchen was the wife of the boarding boss getting dinner, some sort of hot apple cake and stew of the cheapest cuts of meat. Along one side of the room was an oilcloth covered table with a plank bench on each side. Above it a rack holding a long row of handless white cups and a shelf with tin knives and forks. 
Near the up-to-date range, the only piece of real furniture in the room, hung the buckets in which all mill men carried their noon or midnight meals. A crowd of men were lounging cheerfully about, talking, smoking, and enjoying life, making the most of their leisure enforced by the shutdown in the mill. In the room above, double iron bedsteads were set close together, and on them, comfortables were neatly laid. In these two rooms, beside the boarding boss, a Starwalt Bulgarian, his wife and two babies lived 20 men. Yeah, this is a, this is a remarkable, uh, in fact, Byington's whole book, but this passage especially is a remarkable insight into this world um, that they were making. On the one hand, it looks um, like a, a impossibly, impossibly uh, closed or uh, close sort of living, 12 by 20 feet. On the other hand, as she goes along, she begins to uh, uh, begins to reveal something about the conviviality or the sociability in this tiny, this tiny study, um, lounging cheerfully, talking, smoking, enjoying life, leisure, um, and so on. And then the picture of uh, the, the uh, giving us the uh, Bulgarian wife and two babies and the 20 surrounding men. And now, this is a world in which uh, for seven, ten years, uh, most uh, immigrants, uh, male and female, had had their lives. And uh, females would live, of course, in mostly uh, female boarding houses of this sort. And these were all over the place. I lived for one six months learning Hungarian in, in, uh, in Cleveland in the 1960s and got a taste of what this is like. Any rate, it's a world not only of, of this sort of compressed living together. It's a world, would you believe it, of romance. You, you, uh, in the last line, there is the boarding boss. Well, in this uh, boarding house where I live, there was the legend of a star boarder who happened to be a, a big, tall, six foot three guy who uh, had an affair with the woman who ran the boarding house, an affair which became the stuff of song and appeared in an immigrant novel in the 1920s. Uh, and so these were worlds also of romantic entanglements, a world of, um, of song and of, of, well, of literature, became the stuff of literature. So it's a world in which, in which immigrants, despite the seemingly impossible circumstances of their lives, are nonetheless making, well, <laughs> they're making legends of a different sort, of uh, legends of, of uh, astonishing love affairs in the midst of the, uh, the dreariness of life in homestead in a mill town. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's an astonishing world once you get inside of it, and not not the not the not the completely dead end uh, world that uh, that the reformists thought it was. Right, and I think uh, if our teachers used any of Jacob Reese's photographs, uh, this might make an interesting counterpoint. I mean, this this describes the same kind of of uh, living conditions you see in Reese's photographs, but it also in that passage where you have the men talking, smoking, and enjoying life and enjoying leisure. You would never use the word leisure, the words leisure or enjoy, in connection with the Jacob Reese photograph. But I think this passage suggests that even within what we would consider squalor and and you know tight living conditions, these folks are able to, car to carve out some kind of pleasant, meaningful existence for themselves. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. We have a question here from one of our participants. Most of these immigrant workers were men. Did they send home for wives, or what kind of American-born women would be courted by immigrants? Fascinating question. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, I can give two or three answers to that. I'll, I'll do it very briefly. We're just beginning to learn about all this sort of stuff. 
for one thing, they did send home for for wives, um, but they were typically, and we have some of the letters. Uh, I found some of the letters, courting letters, of immigrant steel workers in Pittsburgh and Cleveland sending back for their for their wives, and these are letters full of romantic pleadings, and they're clearly between a man and a woman who had known each other as teenagers. And so their courting is a long distance one, and it's watched carefully by the parents of the woman. So this is a, this is a, this is not just a command appearance. A woman come to Pittsburgh. It is a courting, and it follows an elaborate uh, uh, trajectory just as a long-distance courtship would today. Okay. Secondly, um, as I mentioned earlier in the case of Hutzlevich, uh, <clears throat> by about 1910, the immigrant ratio of men and women was one to one. And so immigrant cities like Pittsburgh, or Cleveland, or Chicago were filled not only by single males, they were immigrant males also by single female. And so early on, there emerged all kinds, there emerged a kind of marriage market, let's call it what it was, a marriage market in which you had all the institutions that you need to carry out a marriage market. Places to meet, uh, uh, ways of going out, uh, forms for asking for a date, uh, uh, a whole variety. You even had, a, in the case of Chicago, a Polish detective firm that would check up on the background of the guy who was trying to make you an offer of marriage. That's this guy like. So people who special or detectives who specialize in this, uh, there's a novel waiting to be written there. I think. At any rate, this was a this was a world of courtship as well as simply a uh, money mark, uh, marriage market. Okay, we and really. The third thing is is the, is uh, just very briefly, did immigrant these immigrant men court non-immigrant or Native American women? Not until the 1950s in the second and third generation. In the first generation and even in the second generation, most of the courting was done, if not in your own ethnic group, certainly within your, in your own religious group. And you mentioned about the novel. I was just going to point out that in our toolbox, The Gilded and the Gritty, we have a passage from the novel Yekel in which a, an immigrant wife comes to the United States yeah. and uh, all, the, all the, the, uh, the difficulties that she encounters there. Uh, Joseph, we need, we need to move on, so shall we go ahead? Yes. Um, well, asking, asking in this uh, fourth part about the creation of a distinctive urban culture, <clears throat> and to make uh, make my point very briefly, given the press of time, um, the uh, immigrants had to communicate. As I've already said, they they communicated in a massive in massive ways with uh, uh, people back in their homeland. They also communicated am amongst themselves in search of work, in search of new locations, in search of, of uh, uh, social ties, in search of political alliances. And so it's uh, the, uh, the world of immigrant is also a world of, of extraordinary forms of communication and cultural creativity. Um, and it's uh, it's this it's this drive toward toward communication that takes the form of, of uh, newspapers that takes the form of, of uh, ethnic theater that takes the form later of uh, of uh, early entry of immigrants into the movie industry uh, uh, and so on and so forth. All of all of that cultural creativity is quite extraordinary and. Uh, and this is in what I'm arguing in, in, a, in a, a whole cohort of, of historians are now arguing is that is that the emer emergence of the sort of distinctive uh, popular culture that's so characteristic of early 20th century city can be traced to this remarkable cultural activity of American immigrants. And the, the selection I've given you here has to do with with the particular 
with the kind of experience that seems to have driven this, maybe paradoxically, driven this, this, uh, this urge to communicate. And that is the extraordinary diversity of, of urban life, of immigrant urban life. And here, uh, a testimony from a neighborhood in Chicago that was mostly Bohemian and Czech um, from, uh, from the late 19th century. Well, what strikes do you, me about do we have time to read that, or do oh, we sure, want to sure. I mean, we want to take a crack at it here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the Bohemian Order of Benedictines of St. Procopius Parish has founded a Bohemian College, which is equivalent to the common high school offering the same curriculum, and it also has a business course, all in the Bohemian language. In each parish, there are parish there are organizations of men and women, many being benevolent others more purely social and religious. There are four Catholic Bohemian newspapers published in Chicago, one daily, one children's paper, and two other weeklies. The, the Catholics uh, have their own halls, theaters, schools, and cemetery. The Protestants have two Bohemian churches, one the Congregational Bethlehem, and the other the John Huss Methodist Episcopal Church, and two Methodist Episcopal missions. They publish two papers, one the Pravda, Congregational, and the other, the Krestansky Polsil, published by the Bohemian Methodist Pastors. These churches have about 1,500 members. So I think that answers uh, the question there. One of our participants asked who ran groups that were trying to Americanize uh, uh, newcomers. And in one case here, it's obviously the churches. That's right. And uh, much of that, um, and to expand on that point, much of the direction of um, Americanizing or, or uh, call them integrating agencies, much of the direction was by the immigrants themselves. Uh, sure, there were settlement houses all over all over American cities that were largely staffed by by Anglo-Americans, such as Hull House, famously Hull House in, in Chicago. And yes, there were Americanizing agencies like the YMCA in uh, all American cities that had big Americanization campaigns. But if you look at the day-to-day -day or the local uh, organizations and agencies that were teaching English, uh, conducting classes in citizenship rights, uh, getting people to polls on election day. Almost all of those direct, were directed by immigrants themselves, not by some uh, uh, Anglo-American elite that was trying to raise immigrants by their boots, by uh, raise them up to some level of Anglo-American life. These were immigrants themselves seizing the uh, uh, the opportunities they had of organizing and of uh, mobilizing to enter into American life fully. And the, the remarkable record we have in the, the few cases of, of, uh, uh, of uh, these immigrant classes, for instance, in English that trace the attendance of uh, adult uh, steel workers in Pittsburgh, attendance at immigrant uh, at classes for immigrants, show us that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, immigrant uh, steel workers from Poland and Slovakia, for instance, are learning English very quickly. They're learning it in classrooms that are staffed by people who also speak Slovak, their own co-nationals and that they are doing this eagerly on their own time. Just as today, most English instruction, instruction in English of recent immigrants is done by organizations run by immigrants themselves, whether we're talking about Dallas or uh, in the case of Mexican immigrants or New York City in the case of recent Chinese. So this is an ongoing process uh, of uh, the quick acquisition of English and everything we have shows that that the immigrants in the early 20th century justice today quickly acquire English because it is absolutely essential in functioning both in the economy and in politi American politics. Joseph, so very quickly, we have the word benevolent in this passage, and that I think relates to one of the questions from the forum. How did lodges and fraternal organizations function in the lives of immigrants? How they did sure. that and what that word benevolent in that, in that context means? Like, <clears throat> benevolent, organization, benevolent organizations were a characteristic immigrant uh, group that organized for three purposes. One is for burial insurance. Uh, 
a sad testimony to the fate we all face, I guess. Um, so burial insurance, a kind of rudimentary health insurance. Many of these immigrant benevolent associations would uh, <clears throat> would uh, have a small fund that they would use during strikes or if someone became uh, disabled by accident, they would contribute in some small way to to their household expenses. And the third reason to organize was to gain citizenship rights. These were these benevolent organizations characteristically conducted English and, and citizenship classes as well. So they were they were ways of self-organizing in the face of some of the big challenges that immigrants faced, and they were an absolutely essential part of the adaptation of immigrants to to American life. And incidentally, top <clears throat> were ways were kind of laboratories in conducting how to conduct a business meeting how to write a petition, how to, to communicate, how to recruit new members. These, these benevolent uh, associations were not just fulfilling a function, they were also training immigrants in some of the essential uh, uh, resources or assets that anybody needs in order to survive in an early 20th century American city. Okay, and your, your, your comments there about um, citizenship participation provides an excellent segue to our last section about uh, political participation. But before we go there, uh, let me just ask a very quick question. What role did the government play in Americanization? Was there any formal role that the, that the government in any way played? Yes, the government did play some important formal roles. <clears throat> uh, just mentioned three. One is by, uh, um, by steady loosening of requirements for for the suffrage for voting. <clears throat> now these would <clears throat> these happen not at a national level but at a local and county and state level where much of political participation in American life goes on still today, as can anybody in Iowa today. Uh, so this kind of, of loosening of of uh, barriers to participation meant that there was uh, there was an uh, that uh, uh, that uh, local and state levels of government uh, steadily opened up the uh, uh, pathway to uh, political participation to immigrants. That's a form of Americanization, not shutting down but opening up. Uh, that reversed after 1924, but that's another story. Secondly, uh, by uh, by the development of uh, of uh, kind of city welfare agencies, much of much of American welfare in the early 20th century, in fact, down to the New Deal, but down to today, occurs at the county and state level, particularly at the county level. And uh, in the early 20th century, every American city uh, developed a kind of local welfare state that would provide uh, uh, health services, uh, help in finding housing, a whole variety of things that would open up the city to immigrants, and the third, and the third, of course, was the development of an extraordinary popular education in American cities in the early 20th century. Remember, uh, American high school as recently as 1978-10 was still an elite institution. It was between 1910 and 1925 the American high school became democratized. This was a time of the enormous building of new high schools all over the immigrant cities, the recruiting of a new uh, cohort of uh, mostly uh, immigrant teachers and the children of immigrants uh, into the teaching profession, so that by 1930, for instance, nearly 65% of all New York high school teachers were the children of immigrants. I mean, that's a massive recruitment. There would have been in 1910 very few immigrants or children of immigrants teaching in Chicago in New York high schools by 1930s. It was, the, it was the way to go. So the development of a massive popular high school uh, system that uh, provided a, a pathway to a different kind of life for for the children of immigrants meant a kind of massive Americanization that, by the way, has longer term consequences. By 1950, uh, uh, the children of immigrants were 
more likely to have a high school education than the children of Anglo-Americans. And by 1970, in New York, for instance, where we know this best, the children of immigrants were more likely to have a college education than the children of Anglo-American immigrants. So that that's a kind of Americanization that uh, that didn't go forward with uh, big political slogans, but it was a very effective way to Americanize the immigrants and especially the children of immigrants. Okay, Joseph, we've got just a few minutes. I think we need sure. to move on to this final section. And uh, finally, a um, uh, question about immigrants and the transformation of American politics. Uh, just to tick off some, some uh, important developments. One, in voting. Uh, the uh, Immigrants voted in massive numbers. By 1910, immigrants and children of immigrants were voting oh, about 80-85% in local elections with a massive participation in the United States. There were a few precincts in 1960 in the Kennedy election that achieved that, and in the Obama election in 2008, there were a few others. But in the early 20th century, by about 1910, almost every immigrant neighborhood was achieving this massive political participation. Now, much of this participation was not the sort of participation that the that the uh, uh, that a good government type would like. It was the participation that was often greased with uh, with uh, five, ten bucks. That was uh, lockstep in lockstep with uh, with uh, machines and that uh, was almost wholly within one one or another party but there was participation secondly the learning of political discipline that went on became an enormous political resource for parties in the early 20th century a new kind of party system emerged that was highly disciplined and capable of mobilizing huge numbers of people and voting and thirdly Immigrants brought to this some very important capacities. The most important, it seems, it strikes me, is illustrated by these uh, six series of photographs that I've offered here. Uh, the capacity is symbol huge crowds, as in the case of garment workers' strike in Chicago in, in December of 1910. Here's people, women, lining up for a protest parade. Uh, marching in disciplined form down the commercial street, West Jackson Boulevard, and marching through their own neighborhoods uh, in the residential street of uh, West Side Chicago. Uh, these, this capacity, which of course the suffrage movement was using as well, as well as the temperance movement would use. So it was a, it was a big important part of American politics in the early 20th century the capacity to mobilize people in public and flood the streets and make your presence physically known. Remember, these are immigrants who in 1905 would have been barely visible on Chicago streets. Here, suddenly, they're flooding into the streets. It's a new political message. We're here and we count in all sorts of ways, not just at the voting booth, but we count in these other ways. And they demonstrated this in other ways too, which is in the powerful nationalist movements that were aimed, immigrants aimed at redeeming their homelands uh, on the eve and during World War I, massive, massive nationalist campaigns that mobilized enormous numbers of immigrants. In the case of the, the Zionist movement, for instance, there were barely 35,000 members in 1910 by the end of World War I, there were over a million members of the Zionist movement in the United States. This is a capacity to mobilize enormous numbers of people that had all kinds of political consequences. And so the flooding of immigrants into public, the capacity to make, to, uh, to organize and discipline political movements, whether for labor unions, or for nationalism, or in the 1920s and especially 1930s, in national political parties made immigrants a powerful force that in the end 
by the early 1930s were capable of changing the balance of power in American politics. Okay. So the, the long run, the long run from entry into the country to uh, to the political transformations of the 1930s saw immigrants uh, playing a very active role. Uh -huh. We have a question here. Do you think new immigrants took their job of being American more seriously than those who didn't have to work to get that spot? It seems to be the case that in looking at these, these pictures here, that uh, education, organization, and voting uh, all tended to, uh, to really uh, make an effort. These people were making an effort to become Americans. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I think it's true. Uh, the enormous amount of, of uh, energy, uh, the enormous number of participants, and especially if you look at the account books of these of these uh, uh, organizing efforts, the the, uh, the dollars, the resources that they devoted to this is just astonishing. Remember, they're typically living as Margaret Byington tells us, a dollar sixty-five. Uh, yet they found the resources with which to mount these campaigns. These are not funded from on high by some angel uh, with a big bank account. These are almost totally funded movements by, funded by ordinary people. Okay. Joseph, I think we've got two more images to show, so why don't we move through those. And while we're putting those on the screen, let me pose a question that, was, that came up earlier, see if you can help us out. Um, some people were wondering if there are any uh, memoirs, immigration memoirs, uh, written by or about adolescents, about teenagers. And you might want to say something too about the age, about the age of people when they came over and when they went to work. I have a suspicion that adolescence was not much of a of a period. I mean, if you were probably 14 or 15 or 16, you were an adult and you were working. Is that fair to say? Yes, it is. Uh, typically, in the Eastern and Southern European village, you would have been at work by the time you were 11, 12, and, that, <clears throat> and uh, um, so there was there was no adolescence, there was no teenager. There were children, and then there were adults. Uh -huh. and, uh, the notion of teenager was a brand new one that had to be invented in the United States as it was during these years. And we don't really have the notion of a teenager in the United States until the 1920s. So the children of immigrants would have gone through teenage years. The immigrants themselves, uh, that would have been an incomprehensible notion, teenage years. They have to learn it from their children. Right. So um, are there any... But would there be any memoirs that, that talked about the, ch the, the experience of children or young people at this time vis-a-vis uh, -vis immigration? Yes, there are some. Uh, some most of them are by way of oral histories taken uh -huh. in later years, in which in which immigrants look back on these years. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it would be useful to the participants, I'll be glad to put together a list of those. There, are, some of them are readily available in print. I think that would be. That would be great. Okay. And we could put those on the forum and people could right. check that in and uh, check in the forum and find those there. Yes, I would be happy to do that. Okay. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our seminar. Uh, let me ask you, have we addressed all of your questions before we wrap things up today? Any, any unfinished business out there that you'd like to raise before we close, uh, close our session this morning? Okay. I don't see any questions coming up. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you for your participation. Let me tell you that uh, you can use the forum. Please continue your discussion. You'll find some additional information there. We will monitor the forum until September 9th, <clears throat> and we'll pass any questions and uh, comments on to uh, Joseph, and he'll respond to them. Uh, in the meantime, let me remind you that your next Florida Virtual School National Humanities Center seminar will take place at 10 a.m. on October 11th, 2011. It will be the blessings of civilization, the roots of American imperialism in late 19th century America, and that will be led by Paul Kramer, an associate professor of history at Vanderbilt University. I want to thank all of you for your participation this morning, and I especially want to thank Joseph for giving us an excellent seminar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have um, a very good day, and I'll just to remind you about how to check out, uh, you go up to the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you click on File, and there will be a drop-down menu, final item there will be leave the session, click on that, and you're home free. Thanks again for your participation. I'm looking forward to being with you all again in October. <laughs>